Sabbath greetings to you all my brothers and sisters out there. We hope that you had a wonderful week and wonderful moments of reflections about the lessons that you have so far looked at. So far, we have looked at lesson number 14, where we learned about how Jeremiah was being denigrated by his own people because he was warning them against the evils they were doing when they were taken into captivity in Babylon. And in lesson number 15, we learned about how Jeremiah met together with Hananiah and that this Hananiah was a false prophet, he was prophesying that the children of Israel were to be released within a shorter period of time and yet the actual duration they should have stayed in Babylon is supposed to be 70 years. So he was a false prophet and we learned that he died because of being a false prophet. And then in lesson number 16, we learned about the characteristics of a true and false prophet, where we learned that uh, a prophet who says he has a vision from God and he has a message from God, he must one, have uh, good fruits, people shall know him or her by, 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 by the way he or she lives, and that whatever he says in the name of Jesus Christ must come true. And then beyond that, it should be someone who keeps the commandments of God and someone who lives in conformity and does not contradict what other prophets of old have spoken. For example, Moses and John in the book of Revelation, they can speak the same language. They are speaking the same language because the same spirit that was using them. So that's one of the characteristics that you can look out for. And in lesson number 17, we learned about uh, conspiracy and the temple foundation that the children of, of Israel had been put together. The time had come for them to go and rebuild the temple uh, in Jerusalem. But that as much as they were very excited about this development from King Cyrus, it happened that the people who came there who, to try to help them, they ended up frustrating their work and that the work had to come to a stopover because the people who were jealous of these children of Israel who wanted to rebuild the temple uh, were not uh, happy that they were about to start rebuilding the temple which was once destroyed by Nebuzaradan. So in today's lesson for Sabbath, May the 2nd, 2020, that is lesson 18, we'll be looking at the continuation of that lesson titled, The Temple Completed Despite Enemy Opposition. The Temple Completed Despite Enemy Opposition. So we are hoping that in this lesson number 18, you are going to be blessed just like you have been blessed uh, by the previous uh, lessons that you have so far looked at. And then moreover, if you are joining us today for the first time, we are encouraging you that before you watch this, or after watching, you can go to 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18, so that you build up, and then next Sabbath, you join us for 19, so that you have a clear mosaic and collage of the story lines concerning how God dealt with his children of Israel. So we are hoping that you're going to enjoy today's lesson. So let us go into the key text for today's uh, lesson. Human power and human might did not establish the church of God, and neither can they destroy it. Not on the rock of human strength, but on Christ Jesus. The rock of ages was a church founded, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Matthew chapter 16 this 18. The presence of God gives stability to his cause. Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, is the word that comes to us today. Psalms 146 verse 3. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. Isaiah chapter 30 Verse 15, God's glorious work, founded on the eternal principles of right, will never come to naught. It will go on from strength to strength, not by might, 
not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Zechariah chapter 4 verse 6, quoted in Prophets and Kings, page 595 and 596. So from here, my brothers and sisters, we have been told to say, no work of God can be deterred by any human mind because the work of God has been established by God himself. And that his church may appear like it's about to fall, that it's going through some difficulties, but it has already been founded upon the might rock that is Jesus Christ and no gates of hell can prevail against it. And that no human power can bring the work of God to naught. But at his appointed time, is going to add power and that the work of God is going to move in the right direction. So if you've been doing something in the field of God and you feel like giving up or maybe you fail to do it for the first time, look to God, the author and finisher of your faith. And you see that at one point or the other, it shall be a success. There'll be no failure because God would allow a disappointment as we learned. God would, would allow uh, a frustration to test our faith. So let us put our confidence in God because it is not by mighty nor by power, but by the Spirit of God. So let us be encouraged by this lesson for today. Lesson number 18 for Sabbath, 2nd May 2020. So let us go into the first question under the subheading the building resumed and threatened the building resumed and threatened you remember last sabbath in lesson number 17 we learned that the building started but it was frustrated and people started thinking maybe this is not the right time to build the house of the lord so they went into their day-to-day -day social life and and forgot about the building of the temple but god again had given a direction that the building must be resumed and threats are all over the place you know whatever you do don't expect an easy way there will be always a frustration so let us learn from this subheading the building resumed and threatened question number one around bc 520 how did the lord encourage his people through his prophets. Ezra chapter 5 verse 1 to 2 and it says, Then the prophets, Haggai the prophet, and Zechariah the son of Edo, prophesied unto the Jews that were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of God of Israel, even unto them. Then rose up Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel, and Yeshua, the son of Josadak, and began to build the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. And with them were the prophets of God helping them. Those are the ways which are coming from the Bible and from the spirit of prophets. But even this dark hour was not without hope for those whose trust was in God. The prophets Haggai and Zechariah were raised up to meet the crisis. In stirring testimonies, these appointed messengers revealed to the people the cause of their troubles. The lack of temporal prosperity was a result of a neglect to put God's interests first. The prophets declared, Had the Israelites honored God, had they shown him due respect and courtesy by making the building of his house their first work they would have invited his presence and blessings according to prophets and kings page 573 and 574 so we have seen for ourselves that these children of israel the ancient israel who did want to build the house of the Lord? They had put their personal interests first and then the interests of God last. And what happened? 
they ended up even being deprived of the blessings which were due to them. Let's go back to the question and then we are going to make some further comments. So around BC 520, how did the Lord encourage his people through his what? His prophets. So here we have learned from uh, Ezra chapter 5 verse 1 to 2 that God addressed that prophet Haggai and Zechariah to go and prophesy unto the Jews that when we are in Jerusalem and in Judah that the name of God had to be again honored by starting the rebuilding of the house of God. And in the spirit of prophecy, we have been told that um, the children of Israel would have received even more blessings had they not put their interests first and their interests of God last. So these are lessons for us, my brothers and sisters, that we should first and foremost seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then whatever we would want and wish for shall come to pass. Seek it first, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then all other things shall be added unto you. Let us learn lessons from the children of Israel, the ancient Israel, how they suffered consequences by neglecting the work of God, by putting their personal interests first and the interests of God last. Let us learn this as a lesson for us today. Let's go to question number two and the sum subheading. What did the adversaries do to try to stop the work again? You remember in lesson 17, we learned that the adversaries came. They were pretending to offer a service and yet they had wrong motives. So these people started the, the first foundation of the temple of God. They were frustrated and they went somewhere. After some time, the work was resumed. And again, they want to come back to frustrate. So that's where this question is uh, coming from. What did the adversaries do to try to stop the work again? According to the spirit of prophecy, how should opponents of the Lord's work be dealt with? I like this question. We'll be reading from Ezra chapter 5, verse 3 to 5, and it says, At the same time came to them Tatnai, governor on this side the river, and Shita Bosnai and their companions, and say thus unto them, who hath commanded you to build this house and to make up this hall? Then said we unto them after this manner. What are the names of the men that make this building? But the eye of their God was upon the elders of the Jews, that they could not cause them to cease till the matter came to Darius. And then they retained answer by a letter concerning this matter. So we have seen they are about to start uh, building and immediately about to start building there comes a group of people to try to ask them under whose authority who was in, uh, inspired to start doing the building. The cause of Christ in dealing even with the adversary of souls should be an example to us in all our intercourse with others, never to bring a railing accusation against any, much less should we employ harshness or severity toward those who may be as anxious to know the right way as we are ourselves. That's one for a change, volume 9, page 240. Take heed first to yourself and then to the doctrine. Do not let your heart become hardened by sin. Closely examine your manners and habits. Compare them with the word of God. And then cut away from the life every wrong habit and indulgence. Kneel before God and plead with him for an understanding of his word. Be sure that you know the real principle all the truth and then when you meet opponents it will not be inside to help in answering every question that may be asked day by day you are to be shut in as it were with Jesus Christ and then your words and example will have a strong influence for good gospel workers page 
105. So these are the ways which are coming from uh, the spiritual prophets. And now getting back to the question, what did the adversaries do to try to stop the work again? So here we are told that these adversaries, they came to start asking, who has given you authority to start rebuilding this temple, which was actually stopped way back? They came to ask such questions. And in the spirit of prophets, we are actually encouraged that we need to be very careful how we do, even with those who are opposing the work. We should follow the example of Jesus Christ, who was so polite and patient even to the adversaries of the souls uh, whom we came to, to deliver from evil. So that's the same method that we need to actually focus on. And we should not focus on fault finding, but we are told that let's lock ourselves most of the times reflecting about the love of God, about his method and techniques of doing things. And in the process, our lives and our style of work uh, will be transformed and will be able to give a living examples to those who see us around. It's quite frustrating to have someone deter you from doing what you, you know that this is right, especially with regard to spirituality. But we are told that even under such circumstances, we need to follow the example of Jesus Christ. He was a pacifist. He followed peace with all men. And the Bible is telling us that follow peace with all men, without which no one shall see God. So even under such circumstances, we need to endure patiently. And at the right time, God will give us a way out. He will give us an elevated and intelligent way of responding to people who are, who are even accusing us of doing the wrong thing or maybe saying evil and so on and so forth. So this way is the only way we can actually escape the temptation that may come our way because the, the devil will not allow you to do the work of God without obstacles. He has to use even the closest friends to you. But God is saying, treat them cautiously, reflecting upon ourselves. Perhaps we might be in the same shoes of being in need of a clear understanding. So let's follow the examples of Jesus Christ. And here we are told that people came to actually ask them, who gave you the authority? Even if they knew that the authority was exactly from God himself, they came to ask such questions. So it's never new today. If it happens, the way out has been provided for us. We need to use the Jesus method. The messages delivered by Haggai and Zechariah roused the people to put forth every possible effort for the rebuilding of the temple. But as they worked, they were sadly harassed by the Samaritans and others who devised many hindrances. On one occasion, the provincial officers of the Medopasian realm visited Jerusalem and requested the name of the one who had authorized the restoration of the building. Look at that. If at that time the Jews had not been trusting in the Lord for guidance, this inquiry might have resulted disastrously to them. But the eye of their God was upon the elders of the Jews that they could not cause them to cease to the matter came to Darius, Israel chapter 5, verse 5. The officers were answered so wisely that they decided to write a letter to Darius Estespes, then the rulers of Medopasia, directing his attention to the original decree made by Cyrus, which commanded that the house of God at Jerusalem be rebuilt, and that the expenses for the same be paid from the king's treasury. Prophet St. Cain's page 578. Have you seen what, what, what is transpiring here? And that this historical event can actually happen today. Let's go back to the question. Who wrote a letter to the king concerning this and what logical balanced points did the message contain? 
So here we have been told that it's actually uh, Haggai and Zechariah. They are the ones who wrote uh, this letter to the, to, the, to the king and that it had very strong arguments to support their position. Say, we have to continue. And they continued. That's what you have been told here. They continued in spite of the question that uh, they received. And we are told that if the Jews were still trusting in their own powers, the question they were asked would have actually caused them to stop the work. But they were courageous and they had to put up uh, ideas together to write the power that was then to seek their guidance. And the guidance was given to make sure that the temple of God would be built uh, at Jerusalem. So we can also learn the same uh, method of work, not to enter into controversy, but to use logic and clear points to support our position. Yeah, so from uh, question number three, we have seen uh, that these brothers were very wise. They would use very clear arguments, just like we are supposed to do the same today, to defend the good cause of God. So they wanted to have their ideas frustrated, but they quickly rushed to the king and sh showed him, say, look, during the time of uh, Cyrus, it was commanded that the temple of God has to be built. So we see no reason why it has to be stopped. Question four. What was the result of this later? What may be learned from this incident and be applied wherever on whenever obstacles or difficulties arise in God's cause? What was the result of this later? And what may be learned from this incident and be applied whenever obstacles or difficulties arise in God's cause. A good a lesson again. Ezra chapter 6, verse 1 to 4, it says, Then Darius the king made a decree, and set was made in the house of the rose, where the treasures were laid up in Babylon. And there was found at Akmetha in the palace, that is in the province of the Medes, a row and therein was records thus written in the first year of Cyrus the king, the same Cyrus the king made a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. Let the house be built, the place where they offered sacrifices, and let the foundation thereof be strongly laid, the height thereof three score cubits and the breadth thereof three score cubits with three rows of great stones and a row of new timber and let the expenses be given out of the king's house you see so record keeping is very important imagine they had thrown away the, 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 the piece of evidence they had they would have actually been defeated by these people and tried, trying to frustrate their effort. So what was the result of this letter? So the result we are told that actually they were given a go ahead to continue building because there was already a decree which was, which was initially made. And perhaps the king was wondering why it was stopped. And what can we learn from uh, this incident as Christians living today? We are told that number one, we need to be People who are very good at keeping records and that we should be people who argue with convincing evidence and that we should not enter into any controversy with the adversaries those who are trying to frustrate our efforts but instead we need to work with evidence argue with clear distinct uh, evidence that's what God wants us to do even today so let us learn lessons from this Question number four. So you've seen the, the storylines <laughs> from lesson number 17 through 18. There's a connection of some kind that we're able to build. And I think even going backwards to other lessons. Let's go to question number five under the subheading Darius's decree to continue building. Darius's decree to continue building. What wonderful change took place because of King Darius's carefulness and support. 
What was particularly remarkable about the king's command regarding the opponents of the people that time? Ezra chapter 6, verse 6 to 9 and 11 to 12. Let's not forget the question that we are interested in. So, what was particularly remarkable about the king's command regarding the opponents of the temple construction and of God's people? Let's, let's read from Ezra chapter 6, verse 6 to 9 and 11 to 12. Now, therefore, Tatnai, governor beyond the river, Shetabosnai, and your companions, which are beyond the river, be far from thence. Let the work of this house of God alone. The governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews viewed this house of God in his place. Moreover, I make a decree what he shall do to the elders of these Jews for the building of this house of God, that of the king's goods, even of the tribute beyond the river, forth with expenses be given unto these men, that they be not hindered, and that which they have need of, both young bullocks and rams and lambs, for the burnt offerings of the God of heaven, wheat, salt, wine, and oil, according to the accompaniment or appointment of the priests which are at Jerusalem, let it be given them day by day without fail. That's what we are taught from Israel chapter 6. Also I have made a decree that whosoever shall alter this word, let timber be put down from his house, and being set up, let him be hanged thereon. And let his house be made a dunghill for this. And the God that hath caused his name to dwell there destroy all kings and people that shall put to their hand to alter and to destroy this house of God which is at Jerusalem. I, Darius, have made a decree. Let it be done with speed. Uh, that, that was a so-called comforting. So it was a consolation on the part of the Jews who were very eager to be the house of God. And the words from Prophets and Kings, page 579, say, Darius searched for this decree and found it, whereupon he directed those who had made the inquiry to allow the rebuilding of the temple to proceed. Let the work of this house of God alone, he commanded. Let the work of this house of God alone, he commanded, yes. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews build this house of God in his place. Prophets and Kings, page 579. So we have seen these words. So, let's go back to the question. What wonder of change took place because of King Darius' carefulness and support? So the wonder of change that took place was there was an emphatic direction that was given. A decree was made that the temple of God has to be built in its right place, right where the foundation stone or a cornerstone was laid exactly. That was the place where the church of, of God or the temple of God was to actually be constructed, confirming everything. And initially it was thought maybe they were going to fail, but look at how things changed. And partly because the records were well kept and they were used as a piece of evidence to advance the argument in support of the building of the temple of God. What was particularly remarkable about the king's command regarding the opponents of the temple construction and God's people. So, very remarkable in his statement was that he even gave the exact place where this has to be done and that there were supposed to be offerings to be given for the construction of the temple of God. Look at that. That's, that was very profound and remarkable because when you start out a project, you need resources 
and the command even resources according to the way it was written initially remember what we learned in lesson number 17 we learned that people we are commanded to offer offerings from from animals gold silver and other free wills and this is what should happen even today we should bring many offerings for the house of the lord to be built moving on to question six what impetus did this give to the work of construction you remember in question five they were given a go-ahead and also to provide the resources for the people we are building and even for the building so what impetus did this give to the work of construction what did the authorities do immediately ezra chapter 6 verse 13 says then tatnai governor on this side the river sheta bosnai and their companions according to that which darius the king had sent so they did speedily the king further decreed that severe penalties be meted out to those who should in any wise alter the decree and it closed with a remarkable statement listen the god that hath caused his name to dwell there destroy all kings and people that shall put to their hand to alter and to destroy this house of god which is at Jerusalem I Darius have made a decree let it be done with the speed is 12 of Israel chapter 6 thus the Lord prepared the way for the completion of the temple prophets and Kings page 579 look at how God works in mysterious ways in the ways that we least expect God works Let's go back to the question and then we'll come back to the discussion. What impetus did this give to the work of uh, construction? And indeed, it gave a very powerful impetus. And the work was to be done speedily because of what the king said. And he commanded the temple must be rebuilt and the beauty must continue and that people must offer offerings. So, such a decree gave an impetus or a driving force to the, the people who were involved in the project to reduced the temple of God at Jerusalem. What did the authorities do immediately? They immediately uh, went actually to start the process of building the temple of God. This is wonderful. And even in the time that we are living in, there are lessons that we can derive from such scenarios that when impetus is given, let us not be sluggish. Let us grab it with all our might and move forward to do that which God has commanded us to do. Let's go into the last question of today's lesson. Because of the Lord's great help and power, what occurred in BC 515? Explain what God's people today especially need to learn from this experience. Ezra chapter 6 verse 15 to 16 says, and this house was finished on the third day of the month Adar, which was in the sixth year of the reign of Darius the king. And the children of Israel, the priests, and the Levites, and the rest of the children of the captivity, kept the dedication of this house of God with joy. The promise, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, his hands shall also finish it, was literally fulfilled, this nine. The elders of the Jews built it, and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Edo. And they built it and finished it according to the commandment of the God of Israel, and according to the commandment of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes king of Persia, and this house was finished on the third day of the month Adar, the twelfth month in our context to be it to be December which was in the sixth year of the reign of 
Darius the king, Israel chapter 6, verse 14 and 15. Shortly afterward, the restored temple was dedicated. The children of Israel, the priests and the Levites, and the rest of the children of the captivity kept the dedication of this house of God with joy. And upon the 14th day of the first month, they kept the Passover, days 16, 17, and 19. Prophets and Kings, page 596. So let's go back to the question. We answer it and then we'll be able to make any quick comments or submissions that you may have either online or you can even uh, communicate through our uh, Facebook account. We have a Facebook account where we are going to direct you so that you can uh, have some more insights. Because of the Lord's great help and power, what occurred in BC 515? So here we are told that the house of the Lord was beautifully and on a good note completed. Explain what God's people today especially need to learn from this experience. And main lessons can be uh, derived from today's lesson. That, number one, we should not give up. We should not be discouraged, my brothers and sisters. Let us seek God in all things that we do. And He shall direct our paths. Whatever we touch, in the name of Jesus Christ, shall be done. In fact, John chapter 14 Verse 13 to 15 is very clear. Whatever we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, he shall do it so that his Father's name can be what? Glorified. That's the idea. So whatever you're doing, do it to the honor and glory of God. Whatever you, you touch, it shall come to fruition. You will not fail along the way. You may be frustrated along the way, but God may allow that to test your faith. If you remain persistent and asking God in faith, it shall actually make your plans come true, either spiritually or even materially. It's very, very important for us to learn these lessons from the children of Israel. And that trusting God alone is what can work miracles. Trusting in God and then wait for His time to do a miracle. And He's going to do it. The ways of encouragement as we close, it is not the open and avowed enemies of the cause of God that are most to be feared. But that statement, it is not those who are avowed enemies of the word of God that we must fear the most. But who? Those who like the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin come with smooth words and fair speeches, apparently seeking for friendly alliance with God's children, have greater power to deceive. It's very true because they'll come to pretend to be brothers. They'll come to pretend to be sisters. And yet they are not sisters. They are not brothers. They are not companions. They have come with a motive to frustrate the world. Hmm. Against such, every soul should be on the alert, lest some carefully concealed and masterly snare take him away. So we are told that we actually have to be very extremely careful because the people who may betray the plans that we may have for God or even for personal uh, programs might be those who are the closest, those who actually appear that they are in support but inwardly they are contrary in all angles and ways against what you want to do. And especially today, when earth history is closing, the Lord requires of his children a vigilance that knows no relaxation. So, my brothers and sisters out there, as we are going towards the end of this world, we know that the world is ending anytime soon. This is a time we need to grab the double portion of the vigilance to contribute to the work of God, to contribute to the well-being of others, and to work extra harder to have our characters perfected. We are perfected by doing the will of God. 
But though the conflict is a ceaseless one, none are left to struggle alone. That's an assurance. That's a promise from, from the Lord. So the, the battles may be tough, but we are told that not one, and not one of the least, has to be left to struggle alone. Angels help and protect those who walk humbly before God. Never will our Lord betray one who trusts in him. So my brother and sister, if you want the fulfillment of the promises of God, trust in God. In fact, Proverbs is telling us that. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he shall direct your path. So my brother and sister out there, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Whatever you do shall succeed. It may take long, but God at his own appointed time is going to do it and you shall succeed. As his children draw near to him for protection from evil, in pity and love, he lifts up for them a standard against the enemy. Touch them not. He says, for they are mine. I have graven them upon the palms of my hands. Prophets and Kings, page 570. This is a very good concluding part. I love it. It's so encouraging. It's so encouraging, my brothers and sisters. Let us not despair. Let us not give up. But we should continue to trust in the Lord. And at His appointed time, you shall see the miracles that is going to perform in our lives. And the work will move. Whatever we touch shall move with a supersonic speed and it shall come true. What we need to do is let us set our motives right. Let us not try to uh, pretend to be in support of the work when actually our motives are to destroy. And I would love to apply this not only to spiritual context, but I think even in the lives that we are living in, we should not be such who have been described as they will come like very polite friends, helpful, but their motives is to tweak your plan and make you fail. God never created you to be a failure, but to be a very successful planner and implementer of the plans, both of God and for your personal development. So may these few words that we have learned today transform each one of us, encourage us, and to challenge us to go beyond the prevailing circumstances. When we trust in the Lord, is going to raise the standards for us and we shall fly above the average way of doing things, average way of thinking, average way of speaking. We shall speak exactly the way Christ will speak. We shall do things exactly the way Jesus Christ will do them if we were to be in our place or in our positions. So my brother and sister out there, it's my humble prayer that the Holy Spirit may speak more than I have spoken so that we may apply the lessons that you have learned from today's lesson to various contexts and to help others to actually move forward, to persevere and do the will of God and his work in spite of the obstacles. May the good Lord bless you and keep you wherever you are, wherever you're listening us from, wherever you we are doing your other things. We are praying that the Lord may bless you. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.